This is Mel Allen. Coming up on This Week in Baseball, the St. Louis Cardinals sizzle in their own backyard and chalk up a string of wins to get a share of first place. Unmasking the catching crisis. My father uh, got me into catching. I was about uh, five years old, I guess, when I first realized what baseball really was and what my ambitions were in life. Madness and mayhem at Wrigley, where everyone is slipping up on the job. Sit tight, folks. We'll untangle it all. Coming up on This Week in Baseball. I mean, uh, hey, no wonder the Cardinals were whistling a happy tune. After a sizzling 16-game homestand, they moved into first place. No hitter was more productive than Pedro Guerrero. In April, he delivered a club record 19 RBIs. Hardy numbers for the 11-year veteran who's been thinking different strokes. This will do it. The Cardinals win it. I always say that uh, to get RBIs, you don't have to really uh, uh, hit home runs. Uh, you know, especially with the with the speed that, that I have hidden in front of me, I think uh, I think by hitting an extra base hit, uh, I can get a lot of RBI. So I, I'm just not looking forward to hit home runs. Former Philly Milt Thompson is just looking for steady work. The way he's been hitting, no problem. Filling in for the injured Willie McGee, Thompson ran up a 325 average and a 15-game hitting streak. Also flipping out the Cardinals at the plate. Vince Coleman hitting near 350. Of course, nothing unusual about his base running, which has produced a league-leading 13 steals. On the pitching scene, Jose De Leon has turned in convincing numbers, a five-and-one record, including two shutouts. That's quite a turnaround from 1985 when he lost 19 games with the last place Pirates. Though his record did not reflect it, that season and later when he went to the White Sox, De Leon showed flashes of brilliance. Then last year, he joined the Cardinals and blossomed, winning 13 games. Now he had more than just the right stuff. Getting his fastball in better spots. Uh, he's always had a good fastball. He has a curveball and the uh, forkball. At times he used to overthrow a lot and really reared back and through the fastball. Uh, now I think it's a pitch selection, uh, keeping hitters off stride, and hitting spots with his fastball. I think the big difference was for me being traded to the White Sox and being traded again here to an organization like the Cardinals. He was different because uh, I, I knew they had a winning team and they, they've been knowing as a winner. And I think uh, I changed my attitude coming here and, and it made it a bit different for me. De Leon has made a big difference for the Cardinals, who would like nothing better than to make a big difference in the East. What a difference up in the Bronx, where the Yankees had been in a funk. With the lineup lacking power and a pitching staff lacking consistency, they lost seven of their first ten games. Everything seemed to be rubbing them the wrong way. That is, until a few sluggers got on the stick. Holy cow, is it? Body English, body English. Holy cow! Grand slammer! Ho, ho, holy cow! He turned those boos to cheers. Bringing cheer back to the Bronx, the downtrodden Yankees were back up. And behind a revived pitching staff, they went 11 and 6. Nothing could please manager Dallas Green more than the pitching of Dave LaPointe who bounced from team to team before signing with the Yankees. This season, after a slow start, he won three straight. Former Padre Andy Hawkins also came to the team as a free agent. And he, too, had a shaky start, but then got sharp, thanks to some key advice from pitching coach Billy Connors. It was just a matter of going back and looking at film. 
and it was pretty obvious. And Billy was, you know, he was the first to catch it. So he made the adjustment in my delivery, and I made a small adjustment in my slider, and you know, things are pretty close to normal now. We had a lot of reports on hitters and stuff, and then finally I said, Andy, we can't worry about all that other stuff. We, we just got to worry about you throwing strikes, keeping the ball down a little more consistently, and getting a little better slider. I said, when you have those ingredients, you can win in the American League. Sound advice and sound numbers from Ricky Henderson, a leadoff man with a flair for the long ball. Ricky Henderson drills it. Deep drive and a leadoff home run for Ricky Henderson. He is now the all-time leader in leadoff home runs. That's number 36. He passes Bobby Bond. The golden anniversary of a record that may never be broken was celebrated this week. Fifty years ago, Lou Gehrig's career ended, and with it, his streak of 2,130 straight games. That day, May 2nd, 1939, an ailing Lou Gehrig turned first base over to Babe Dalgan. Just before the game started, Lou, being the captain of the ball club, walked down to the the uh, umpire Basil at uh, home plate and he handed him the lineup. And uh, he came back to the bench and he walked right past us to the drinking fountain and he re reached over to get a drink and he stayed down a long time and Johnny Murphy took one of the clean towels. He, Johnny Murphy was our relief pitcher, one of them. And he threw the towel and landed right on Lou's head. And he just stayed down, and finally he stood up, and he, he was wiping the tears off his eyes. He, he cried. He broke down. And then in the seventh inning, I went to him, and I said, Lou, you got to keep your streak going. And he, he just said, no, you're doing fine, babe. And the eighth inning, I went back to again, because he was sitting right in the uh, outside corner of the bench, practically on the field. I said, Lou, you got to get in the ball game. Keep that streak going, because I didn't know he was sick. And... Uh, he said, no, you're doing fine. And in the, in the ninth inning, I said, Lou, this is your last chance to get out there and keep the streak on. And he, he said, go on, get out there. And that was it, and the streak was broken. Now, this week's quiz, brought to you by today's Chevy truck. The Cardinals' John Morris has been a prince in the pinch, going a perfect five for five. Can you name the player with the most pinch hits in a row? My father uh, got me into catching. I was about uh, five years old, I guess, when I first realized what baseball really was and what my ambitions were in life. My father thought that catching was the quickest way to the big leagues, and he thought that uh, that's what the big leagues needed. And uh, as a result, uh, I had a reputation as a catcher all my life because I started out as a catcher when I was six years old in Little League. Bench grew up to become what many consider to be the game's greatest catcher bringing still more glamour and prestige to a position that had produced more than its share of stars. But these days, the focus has changed. Fewer and fewer young players want to catch. And the ones that take the job are, for the most part, not measuring up to their predecessors. It's hard to know exactly why so many would-be catchers have said, no thanks. But one thing is sure clear, it's one demanding job. To be a catcher, you have to have a pretty good understanding of the game. I think you're totally involved in every aspect of the game. Having signs relayed from the bench, having to relay signs to the infielders, having to know what plays are on in what situations, being able to handle a pitching staff, being somewhat of a psychologist when you're out on the field, you have to be able to communicate with the pitcher on the mound, be able to calm him down in situations when uh, he might tend to get a little excited. It's a very demanding position. And uh, I really believe that most people would rather not have to go through that if they could avoid it. Greg, you catch. Oh, I want to catch. Greg, catch. That may be the first problem. No youngster wants to put on the so-called tools of ignorance. It's generally accepted, even at the playground, that if you catch, you're not good enough to do much else. Begin in the neighborhood. It's always the, the fat kid who can't play anyplace else. They always make him the catcher. Even the kid you try to hide, you put him in right field. So nobody wants to catch. Kids today don't want to work hard at learning the catching position. They see it as a, a, a demotion. They don't think of it as being the quarterback of the ball club, and they don't want to get behind that plate. It's a highly skilled position, and I think that's what's uh, the toughest part as far as developing young players. A lot of kids, they put that gear on, they get a couple of foul balls, they have to learn how to block a ball. 
and they shy away and they say, well, I'd rather go to third base or, or first base. Little League moms and dads and high school moms and dads wanting their great athletes to be the quarterbacks and be the shortstops and be the pitchers. The last thing in the world they want them to do is take that great athlete and put them behind the plate because everyone reads about the tools of ignorance and the broken fingers that they get and shorten their careers. So consequently, the guy who is less than the great athlete on the field is put behind the plate. And that's the guy who becomes the high school catcher, that's the guy who becomes the college catcher, and that's the guy who becomes the professional catcher. One of the most important jobs of a professional catcher is to throw out base runners. But these days, since baseball has become a running game, the catcher's job may be harder than ever. Hayes is going this time. Biggio's throw, it's a beauty, but late. This is a perfect throw by Biggio. Catching uh, may not be as easy as it used to be. Uh, we've got a lot of guys that run real fast now. Most of the fields are turf, so they're at least a step and a half faster on the turf. And right now, it's tough to get guys, you know. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a very glamorous position right now because, uh, boy, all these guys are running and running and running, and, and uh, it's tough to get them sometimes. If you look back and compare the number of stolen bases in the past as to today, the game has changed. We start in the paper every day by saying, who caught stealing, what percentage does he have caught stealing, anything like that. And it puts so much mental pressure and physical pressure on a catcher that he cannot maintain much of an offense. And I don't think that's necessarily the way to help catchers look good. For the most part, you don't see catchers playing 140 or 145 games anymore. Most teams have two catchers, so they sort of split some time. Most of the catchers in the league now are catching 110, 112 games, and that's a big difference. Offensively, it's tough to have the real big numbers and hit 35 home runs and drive in 100 runs when you only play 115 or 120 ball games. One reason catchers play as short a season, the injury factor. There's no question the position comes with an assortment of potential mishaps, a fact that over the years has left catchers searching for ways to stay clear of casualties. I found that the only way you can play this game is to play it healthy and to stay in the lineup and help the club and, of course, help yourself. So by catching one-handed, I keep my free hand, this throwing hand, away from the flight of the ball and where foul tips might be able to hit it. Bench's one-handed style, which he used so successfully, was not, however, the answer for every catcher. Johnny Bench has run more catchers than anybody I've ever seen. He made it look so easy with the one-handed grabs that everybody's trying to do this. And they're all missing the ball. You know, Bench would go like this, he'd catch it. Go like that, he'd catch it. You watch them today go like this, and they go, oops. They better get a pair of Nike track shoes, because it's back there. Basically, as a one-handed catcher, you're able to stay in the lineup. Now, if they wanted to go back to the old way, sure, you got some quicker releases at times. That's going to be effective. But at the same time, what happens is that you get so many guys that are injured by catching two-handed, they're going to have a bag of walnuts, as they used to call them, and you're going to have to find 10 other guys that you're catching in the major leagues. No longer could you go with just two catchers on a ball club. That luxury was created by the one-handed catching. These days, the Padres' Benito Santiago has come up with a style all his own, throwing from his knees. Regarded as the best young catcher in the game, Santiago has brought respectability back to the position, though some say it was just a matter of time. When I was a kid, there were no catchers except Barra and Freehand. And everyone said, fastest way to the big leagues is a catcher. Well, all that era following those people, myself, Bench, Sanguian, Boone, uh, Carter, Yeager, they all knew that if they could hit a little bit, they'd get to the big leagues quickly. So we all did. Well, cyclical in the sense that once we all got there, if you had a kid who could hit, the very last place you'd tell him as a 14-year-old to go and play position-wise was catcher, because it was the slowest way to get to the big leagues. Now today, our era has passed. Fisk is still around, Carter's still around. But if you have a kid who's 14 years old, and you say, fast way to the big leagues, if you can hit, be a catcher. There's none of them there. It's cyclical in that sense. Either way, the job description does lack appeal, though it wasn't so long ago that kids would apply in a minute. Oh, the land of the free and the Eat your heart out, Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> now, the answer to this week's quiz, brought to you by today's Chevy truck. When Dave Philly played for the Phillies in the late 50s, he set a major league record for most consecutive pinch hits, nine. Mm -hmm. 
Watch the bouncing ball, folks. Because under the lights at Wrigley Field, the Cubs and Padres never quite knew where the ball would bounce. For starters, Cubs second baseman Ryan Sandberg made his first throwing error in 248 games. But that wasn't Rhino's only blunder of the night. Ground ball. Ryan Sandberg and into center field. Gwynn scores and Clark will go to third. Sandberg wasn't the only one having a rough night of it in the field. In fact, some fans were beginning to wonder what would happen next. Bouncer to third. Reddy's up for this one, and the throw pulls Clark off the bat. This one, a bunt charged by Wilkerson, and a bad throw. Skips by Grace, goes down into the bullpen. Double play ball, out at second, out at third. Oh, a wild throw. Safe at first, he's going to go on to second base, and he'll be safe. Chalk up a team record six errors for the Padres and five for the Cubs. And a liner into left. Varsho cuts across and he can't catch the ball. It's a double play if he does. You catch better it. believe it. While Cub defense was hard for Don Zimmer to believe, Padre coach Sandy Alomar couldn't help but wince over his son's play at second. Hit on the ground. Alomar has it come up on him and bounce away from him for an error. Here's the 2-1. Ground ball. That's headed up the middle. Alomar backhanded stop. Throw to first. Not in time. This one will go into the dugout and Dawson's going to wind up at second. Ground ball to Alomar. Hey! He fumbles the ball again. Another error. If David Letterman is here watching it, nothing is done that could be half as funny. This is a comedy of errors. Which did not stop when Mark Davis came in. Even for the flawless reliever, this was a night of imperfection. The pitch. Well, oh, tap back to the mound. Throw to first base. They save the third from Clark Hawk. An error on Davis. All together for the two teams, 11 errors. But number 11 turned out to be lucky for Davis, who picked up his 11th consecutive save as the Padres won 5-4. to four. This spring, the fence was the main order of business for new left fielder Kevin Mitchell, who got a few tips from Willie Mays. Of course, when Ozzie Smith came to bat recently, no one figured on this. And that's sliced uh, to left field, and it's another chance for Mitchell, and he makes a barehanded catch! In my entire life, I've never seen that happen. Folks, would you like to see that again? Now, more tricks from the good hands people, only this time with their gloves on. So chew on this lively leather, folks. Starring in this order, Oakland second baseman, Tony Phillips. Seattle's Omar Vizquel. Gary Gaetti, Minnesota. The Reds, Cal Daniels. The Mets, Mookie Wilson. John Russell, Brave. Milwaukee's Gary Sheffield. Kent Herbeck, Minnesota. The Cubs, Ryan Sandberg and teammate Mitch Webster. Detroit's Chris Brown. Robbie Thompson, Giants. Pittsburgh's Ray Quinones. Cleveland outfielders Joe Carter and Corey Snyder. Randy Kutcher, Red Sox. Seattle's Mario Diaz. Detroit's Fred Lynn. And the Mets' Lenny Dykstra. Over and out. Time now for This Week in Baseball's Twib Notes from Around the Majors. Jack Morris and the Detroit Tigers have been in a woeful slump. In losing to Seattle, Morris ran his record to 0-6. The first time in his 13 seasons that he's ever lost more than four straight decisions. Much ado in Brenham, Texas, where high school pitcher John Peters made history before a crowd of 4,000 people. 
one-third the town's population. In beating Consolidated of College Station, Peter set a national high school record with his 51st consecutive win. Peters has not been beaten since his United States team lost to Taiwan in the Senior Little League World Series four years ago. As for this game, his bat helped clinch the win, which was also his fifth no-hitter. By the way, Peters plans to attend Texas A&M. Time now for our Player of the Week, brought to you by Gatorade Thirst Quencher. Bob Ojeda looks to be on the mend after a gardening accident last season in which he almost severed the top of his finger. No small disaster for the split-fingered specialist. Recently, after losing his first three starts, Ojeda beat the Braves for his first win, helping the cause with a pair of hits as he kept the streaking Mets streaking. Next week on This Week in Baseball, our Hall of Fame series recalls Hank Greenberg, the original Hammerin' Hank, a hitter of uncommon clout. That's all for now, folks. See you next week on This Week in Baseball. Who will go home $50,000 richer on the Michigan Lottery Game Show, Fame and Fortune? Join host John Hennick at tonight at 7.30 and find out. And tomorrow, meet a woman who claims to be Michael Jackson's wife and charged a wedding dress to his account. It's a special report on fans who've gotten out of control on the news for night beat at 11. Now, the Tigers take on the Oakland A's coming up next, only on Channel 4.